When British Railways was formed in 1948, the locomotives of the London and North Eastern Railway, or LNER, were allocated a batch of numbers in the 60,000 range. This put their locomotives fourth in the order of locomotive numbering. Since then, it has been traditional to make LNER matters the fourth in any series on railways. Thus it is with this programme, the fourth in a series of five, looking at Britain's railways then and now. The famous King's Cross station was the best known of all the LNER stations, and so we start our nostalgic review at the Cross in 1959. A3 Pacific number 60047 Donovan runs into the service facility to the west of the station. From the 20s to the demise of steam, most of the express traffic was hauled by Sir Nigel Gresley's magnificent Pacifics. Another one of his A3 Pacifics, Robert the Devil, arrives with an express from the north. These engines were named after famous racehorses. A beautifully clean A4 Pacific number 60017 Silver Fox waits to depart from King's Cross on the 21st of March 1959. Her driver is impatient for the off, and when given it, Gresley's masterpiece glides away with its train of blood and custard carriages. Nearly five years later, she was cut up at a Doncaster Works. A2 stroke one Pacific, number 60508, Duke of Rothsay, backs out of the station and onto the service facility. This class was a 1944 development of Thompson's rebuild of Gresley's Class P2282, fitted with a Class V2 boiler. Thompson's B1460, number 61066, backs out and runs by. These useful mixed traffic locomotives were introduced in 1942, and 409 were eventually built. Perhaps they were Thompson's true epitaph. Gresley condenser fitted N2 stroke 4 062 tank number 69575 departs from the cross with its train of articulated coaches. These engines worked suburban trains to and from Moorgate, necessitating small chimneys to comply with the old metropolitan loading gauge. A Gresley V2262 number 60833 brings in a train from Newcastle. For LNER devotees, these were the engines that won the war. The distinctive sloping side tanks tell us that this is a Gresley J50 060 tank on station pilot duties at King's Cross. Recently fitted with a double chimney, A3 number 60055 Woolwinder backs out light engine. Sister engine number 60059 Tracery also boasts one of the new double chimneys and storms out with an express for the north. Most of these engines were later fitted with the so-called German smoke deflectors. We like Ike must be the words of the excited spotters as number 60008 Dwight D. Eisenhower arrives with the up-flying Scotsman. Ike survives today. He is preserved far away in the USA. The variety of over a third of a century ago is sadly lacking at today's King's Cross. The semi-separate suburban station only sees four car electric units of classes 313 and 317, a far cry from the Gresley suburban tanks. A certain continuity of line can be seen in the Class 91 electric locomotives, which today dominate the former LNER main lines and express services out of King's Cross. After all, it's only appropriate. Streamlined locomotives were first introduced here by Sir Nigel Gresley. The Class 91s usually push their trains into King's Cross, as seen here. 
The train is driven remotely from a DVT or driving van trailer. As the train passes, it reveals a pair of diesel locomotives of class 47. These were the last types of locomotives to be seen regularly at King's Cross in recent years. But even this has become a then scene, as electrical multiple units took over post office workings from the end of September 1996. A powerful lineup of class 91 locomotives is about to be swollen by the arrival of yet another train from the north. These engines and their matching coaching stock dominate East Coast services now. A class 317 unit emerges from Gasworks Tunnel and enters the suburban station, passing the site of the old locomotive servicing facility which we saw in 1959. Before electric services commenced over the whole of the East Coast Main Line, diesel high-speed trains were used. As the suburban services had been electrified, this eliminated locomotive haulage on trains from King's Cross, so the locomotive service facilities which remained in use after the elimination of steam, became redundant. Today, the site is in the throes of redevelopment. As can be seen here, all platforms except the last two on the left-hand side of our picture can be accessed from the main lines through Gasworks Tunnel. There are still gas holders on the site, but of course no gasworks in the days of North Sea gas. As the Class 313 draws into the platform, the rounded train shed of St Pancras Station can be seen in the background. If all goes to plan, the changes at King's Cross and St Pancras in the future will be far more extreme than we have seen in our then and now scenes here. St Pancras has been chosen as the future principal channel tunnel terminus for the continental main line from Folkestone and the continent. A class 317 leaves from one of the main line platforms on a Cambridge service. For our final view at King's Cross, we see a Class 91 hauled express leaving. These trains serve mainline destinations including Leeds and Glasgow, also serving important centres such as Peterborough, Doncaster, York, Darlington, Newcastle and Edinburgh. The franchising of the old British Rail Network resulted in these services being run from mid-1996 by Sea Containers subsidiary company which operates under the title Great North Eastern Railway, thus neatly incorporating the names of the two English companies which together built the East Coast Main Line to Scotland. The third partner was the Scottish company, the North British Railway.
we move on up the East Coast Main Line on the metals of the first of the English partners, the Great Northern Railway, to New Southgate. Here we see Gresley's A3 Pacific, number 60066, Mary Hampton, hurrying down the final six-mile stretch into King's Cross. A4, number 60006, Sir Ralph Wedgwood, named after the Chief General Manager of the LNER from 1923 to 1939, follows. It's climbing the 1 in 200 gradient with a northbound express. Following on Sir Ralph's heels is another of Gresley's smaller mixed traffic class V2s. Number 60924 roars by with another express. A very clean black Thompson B1 and number 61279 races up the gradient with a Cambridge-bound semi-fast. Lined black was the designated colour for mixed traffic engines, but the V2s were so frequently used on express passenger services that a number of them received the passenger lined green livery from the mid-1950s onwards. Another of these versatile engines is seen a little further up the line near Red Hall signal box just to the south of Hatfield Station, 16 and a half miles from King's Cross. A4 Pacific, number 60020, Guillemot, hurtles past with an express, as B1, number 61251, Sir Oliver Berry, gets a ballast train underway. Approaching Hatfield on the 18th of July, 1959, Gresley A4, number 60029, Woodcock, streaks towards the cross, closely followed by classmate 60008, Dwight D. Eisenhower. A member of this superb class, number 60022, Mallard, was the fastest ever steam locomotive in the world. And locomotives of this class were frequently referred to as streaks. One of the 251 British Railway Standard Class 9Fs clanks by with a ballast train. These powerful engines were very popular with their crews, being excellent workhorses. This one has one of the BR1F tenders, the largest type of tender used on standard locomotives. Two more A4s streak by. The first is number 60034, Lord Farrington. The second A4 is number 60010, Dominion of Canada, its original name. LNER built, but Great Eastern designed, N7-5, number 69646, runs by light engine. One of the tank's successors, a DMU, scurries out of the way as a V2 passes on a fully fitted express freight consisting of vans. Next is a Peppercorn Class A1 Pacific, which hurtles towards the magnificent signal gantry. Class WD-280, number 90428, lifts her safety valves on a ballast train. This engine was built by the North British Locomotive Company in Glasgow in 1943 for the War Department as their number 77113. She was bought by the LNER in October 1947 and numbered 3107. British Railways at first numbered her as 63107 before they purchased many more of the type which had become redundant after the war and reclassified and renumbered the entire class. Returning to the line at Southgate today, the view is obscured by trees and recycling containers. A Class 91 pushed train is seen from the modern road bridge at Red Hall. The signal box was abolished long ago, and as the railway passes through the modern town of Hatfield, a relief road crosses the line where the old box used to stand. The outer lines here are the local lines, and a Class 313 is seen on a service terminating on the main line. These local services are operated by the West Anglia Great Northern franchise, one of the last to be offered for sale. The Class 313s were the product of the early 1970s, whilst the 317s, a pair of which is seen heading towards London, are from the end of that decade. 
The most important difference in the construction of the 313s and 317s is in the material used. The earlier 313s are constructed of aluminium, whilst the 317s are comparative heavyweights built from steel. In many ways, the latter were a retrograde step, as aluminium has been used for more modern types of unit following the 317s. Another pair of 313s is seen at Hatfield Station as we witness a change in atmosphere. Today, it's impossible to film or photograph trains in the area just to the south of here due to unrestricted tree growth. The snowy conditions brought an unusual vehicle onto the East Coast Main Line during daylight hours, an engineer's track machine. There were two generations of diesel power on the East Coast Main Line before the electrics appeared. The second of these was the well-known HST or high-speed train, some of which still run under the wires to destinations on non-electrified lines, such as Aberdeen and Inverness. Before we go back to see the first generation of diesels on the East Coast Main Line, we'll return to the metropolis to see the LNER's most intensive suburban operations. These were the former Great Eastern Railway services out of Liverpool Street Station, known as the Jazz Services, from about the end of the First World War. In the Stygian gloom of Liverpool Street Station, Britannia Pacific No. 70007, Coeur de Lyon, departs. The engine is on a Norwich via Colchester service. Coeur de Lyon was the first Britannia to be withdrawn and was scrapped at Crew Works in July 1965. Sister, or should it be brother, Britannia No. 70001, Lord Herkham, awaits its next call of duty in the locomotive yard before the immaculate station pilot, N7-4062 tank No. 69614, backs in passing Bresley B17460 No. 61618, Winard Park. Britannia Pacific 70030, William Wordsworth, waits to depart with an express to Norwich. The Britannias took over the Great Eastern Mainline services from the B-17s. Green electric multiple units clatter by in the background as Thompson B-1460, number 61335, is turned. Electrification had first come to Liverpool Street in 1949, with the energising of the wires to Shanfield for outer suburban services. A genial driver gives a bit of advice to a fellow workmate on the footplate of William Wordsworth, as some youthful spotters lark about on the edge of the platform. Another Britannia Pacific, number 70002, Geoffrey Chaucer, arrives with an express at this busy station. This engine can be seen at the end of its days in volume three of this series. Holden J69060 tank, number 68613, shunts empty coaching stock. Known as buck jumpers, these little engines were the mainstay of the jazz services in the 1920s. William Wordsworth finally gets underway. The 55 strong Britannia class were introduced in 1951 and were designed at Derby. The first batch was allocated to the Great Eastern section where they were gratefully received. The first of the class, Britannia herself, backs off the station. She is happily preserved in working order. In contrast to the condition of the sister engine seen earlier, J69 number 68619 is seen in a spotless condition. This was a 1950s initiative for station pilot duties. The other station pilot seen earlier, N7-4, number 69614, is as shiny as a new pin as she backs down onto a train. Her Westinghouse pump can be clearly seen, as the old Great Eastern was an air-braked railway. Coeur de Lyon makes a lion-hearted departure as we say farewell to Liverpool Street in 1959.
Liverpool Street was the terminus for the commuters of North London and Hertfordshire. Just prior to the electrification of these lines in 1960, some of the jazz services are seen on the lines radiating from the terminus. N7 stroke 5, number 69665, arrives at, and sister engine 69654 departs from, Lower Edmonton High Level Station, opened in July 1872. The trains consist of Sir Nigel Gresley's well-known quad art sets. These were articulated sets of four coaches, the inner ends sharing bogies. N7 stroke 5, number 69665, runs into Lower Edmonton Station with a train to Enfield Town. At Enfield Town, sister engine 69664, in spotless condition, is seen being uncoupled. The N7 tanks were introduced in 1914 and eventually totaled 134 locomotives. Their designer, Alfred John Hill, was locomotive superintendent of the Great Eastern from 1912 to 1922. Enfield Shed is passed on two separate occasions. This shed was a subshed of Stratford, coded 30A. Stratford Shed was the largest locomotive shed in the British Isles. Enfield was reached off the Chesant Line via Berry Street Junction and Edmonton Junction. Enfield Town was opened on the 1st of August 1872. Liverpool Street is a very different place today. Gone are all the steam locomotives, although the electric wires which dominated the scene in 1959 are unchanged. The only locomotives normally seen here are the Class 86 electric locomotives which are employed by Anglia Railways on services to East Anglia. They are used in conjunction with driving brake second open coaches or remote control driving trailers. This one is setting out from the country end of the station, which doesn't benefit from the modernization. This is still a Stygian gloom. It was completely rebuilt during the late 1980s to provide an enormous office development over the rail tracks. The station itself was completely transformed and, despite now being almost completely enclosed, is no longer so gloomy. Other mainline services from Liverpool Street to places such as Cambridge, Kings Lynn and Clacton are made up of EMUs. For Stansted Airport services, a dedicated fleet of Class 322s is used. Suburban services employ a variation on the Class 313 family in the form of Class 315. The Class 315s were originally built for services to Shenfield, but have migrated to the inner London lines as time has gone on. This one is approaching Edmonton Green, the modern name for Lower Edmonton. The view from the road has changed somewhat. The modern tower blocks dominate the scene today.
another of the Class 315s enters Edmonton Green Station, which has changed little except for the erection of the overhead paraphernalia. The attractive canopies remain to keep the commuters nice and dry. The 62 members of the 315 class were introduced in 1980 and were the first type of unit to use push-button operated sliding leaf doors, an arrangement that has since become almost universal. Our final view of these jazz service successes is at Enfield Town, which is barely recognisable with its modern concrete canopy and absence of locomotive servicing facilities. Multiple units are bi-directional and have led to great simplification in track layouts, especially at Termini. We remain on Great Eastern Lines, turning now to the main line to Cambridge, where in January 1959, at Pickett's Lock, an L1 tank is followed by a B17 61663 Everton. Also in January 1959, at Broxbourne, a Thompson Class L1 264 tank, number 67702, hauls a local passenger train. At the next station up the line, Royden, B2 class number 61607 Blickling departs on a semi-fast to Liverpool Street. Blickling was originally a three-cylinder class B17 designed by Sir Nigel Gresley in 1928. Edward Thompson rebuilt a number of the class into two-cylindered B2s in 1945. Before the electrification of the line to Bishop Stortford, first-generation diesel multiple units were used and one arrives at Royden on the 25th of January 1959. Another mainline train has one of Thompson's Go Anywhere B1s at the head. Cambridge was a very important railway centre. Several lines radiated from here to March, Ely and Norwich, to Newmarket and Ipswich, to Hitchin, to Huntingdon, to Mildenhall, to Colchester via Bartlow and across to Bletchley via Bedford. There was of course the main line to Liverpool Street as well. Gresley B17 footballer number 61657 Doncaster Rovers kicks off northwards towards Norwich. Cambridge Shed coded 31A was on the west side of the line at the north end of the station. A visiting engine, K3 Mogul, number 61880, is seen on the 18th of October, 1959. She was a K3-3 stroke three introduced by Gresley in 1929 and modified from his earlier design of 1920 for the Great Northern. A B1460 moves off shed, passing an elderly E4 class 240 designed in 1891 by J. Holden. B2, number 61644, Earlham Hall, is next on Shed. Another B17 converted by Thompson. An inside cylindered 460 B12 is seen on Shed. Originally designed by S.D. Holden for the Great Eastern in 1911, the design was upgraded and more were built for the LNER under the auspices of Sir Nigel Gresley. As the B2 reverses away, one of the Holden J17060s appears. This is followed by one of Hill's larger class J20s, the largest Great Eastern freight engines. The railway was always primarily a passenger carrier. As with our other areas, the Great Eastern main line today is vastly changed. Alongside the railway at Pickett's Lock is a new spine road, the Lee Valley Relief Road. Cambridge Station has changed enormously. It's still a major junction, but many of the minor lines have closed. Wires reached the city in the late 1980s, and all services are now in the hands of the ubiquitous EMUs. This one is leaving Cambridge's unique single through platform, split to provide up and down sections, with a train for King's Cross via Royston. 
There are five trains an hour to London, one of which goes to Liverpool Street. The line to Royston and the East Coast Main Line at Hitchin was wired later than that to Liverpool Street. Class 317s provide through services to King's Cross from the bay platforms at the southern end of the station, as well as through trains from King's Lynn. Cross-country services enter Cambridge from the north via Ely, giving an hourly service to Birmingham New Street. Class 158 sprinters are used on these services. Stabled in the yard with a spectacular footbridge behind them is a line of Class 47 diesels belonging to Rez. Since these scenes were recorded, even this small connection to the great days of Cambridge Shed has been eliminated, as Class 325 EMUs took over post office trains from September 1996. The Class 158s terminated Cambridge and returned to Birmingham. Only the lines to Newmarket and Ely remain from the plethora of lines which once ran north of Cambridge. The largest member of the group that made up the LNER was the North Eastern Railway. This could trace its roots back to the earliest days of railways as it included the famous Stockton and Darlington Railway in its own constituents. Near Erzden signal box on the north side of the Tyne, K1 Mogul number 62060 crawls past light engine. The father of the steam locomotive, George Stevenson, came from Tyneside and perfected the design of his steam locomotives here, before the advent of the Stockton and Darlington. Steam was still at work here 153 years later. Today, a section of this line is preserved as part of the Stevenson Museum project. A Class J27060, number 65842, blasts up past Erzden signal box with a loaded coal train. 105 of the J27s were built between 1906 and 1922. On the 19th of August, 1966, an Ivad mogul far from home storms past Erzden Crossing Box on the Tyne and Blythe Line. This is number 43055, and the class have various nicknames, including Duke Bugs and Flying Pigs. They weren't very popular, especially in their early days with double chimneys, when they just would not steam. The Tyne and Blythe opened into Newcastle for public traffic on the 27th of June, 1864. At Erzden, a flat crossing connected Backworth Colliery with Fenwick Colliery. A Q6080, number 63431, propels a brake van on a trip working near Washington on the 18th of August, 1966. These simple freight engines were the Northeastern's principal mineral engines and survived to the end of steam in the Northeast. These engines, along with the J27060s, were the last pre grouping or pre 1922 locomotives to work on British railways. Another of the Q6s, number 63377, storms tender first through Washington with the large chemical works in the background. Both of these engines were cut up locally in 1967. 
At Hall Dean Crossing near the exchange sidings for Vane Tempest Colliery, K1 Mogul number 62026, in deplorable condition, rounds the curve. It's hauling a train of loaded coal wagons for Seaham Harbour. The engine had a life of 18 years before meeting its end at Arnott Young at Dinsdale in November 1967. Sister engine number 62042 rattles by Hall Dean box with a train of empties. J270 number 65811 propels a single brake van on a trip working to Vane Tempest Colliery in preparation for running down the short branch to the colliery to pick up a train of loaded coal. Propelling a van like this on the main line was a rare occurrence on British railways. Having run into the colliery and coupled up to a loaded train, the J27 blasts past Hall Dean signal box and its small platform. This was here at the behest of Lord Vane Tempest, who had the right to board any train he so desired just by getting the signalman to stop the train. WD number 90348 rattles past Hall Dean with some more coal wagons bound for Seaham Harbour. In the northeast, the WDs were locally known as woofer donks, this supposedly being the sound they made and a play on the class designation WD. There were three collieries in the vicinity of Seaham, Vane Tempest, Dorden and Seaham itself. The crossing gates close behind Q663458 on the 23rd of May 1967 as she takes her single brake van up the line from Ryehope to Wingate and Stockton. The journey down Seaton Bank was slow and laborious. All the wagons had to be pinned down by the brakesmen. Here we see Q6 number 63437 gingerly making her descent. The Q6 class comprised 120 members, built between 1913 and 1921 to the designs of Sir Vincent Raven, chief mechanical engineer of the Northeastern Railway from 1910 to 1922. They were designated Class T2 by the Northeastern. The tall signals match the tall signal box as the gates are opened for another freight train. J27 number 65811 storms through with her train. She was withdrawn four months after this shot from Sunderland Shed. At Dorden, sister engine number 65892 cautiously brings a loaded train for shipment through Seaham Harbour. She's then seen vigorously running through Ryehope on the line from Hartlepool to Sunderland. Q6 number 63437 races along and takes the right-hand line at Ryehope Grange Junction with a load of coal for South Dock. The line to Sunderland South Dock diverges here. K1 Mogul 62026 comes up from South Dock on a trip working, heading for one of the Seaham collieries and passes under the substantial signal gantry. J27 65892 brings a load of coal empties out of the South Dock. The footplate crews on these locomotives had a hard life. In the winter, gales would blow in from the North Sea and as the locomotives ran in reverse for 50% of their time, coal dust would be blown into the crew's faces even with a tarpaulin over the cab. For most working men in this area, even this was preferable to mining for coal in the bowels of the earth. Another J27, number 65882, heads south to Seaham at Ryehope Grange Junction. She then brings a load of empties up the line destined for Selksworth Colliery. 65882 made her last journey from Sunderland Shed to Thompson's of Stockton-on-Tees in November 1967. The railway is hanging on at Easton, just. 
It's no longer a junction, but the remaining line still boasts a busy freight service from the Blythe Industrial Area. Overgrown tracks mark the mothboard line from Pelor to Ferry Hill at Washington. It was closed but not lifted when declared surplus to requirements at the end of the 1980s. Here at Washington, only the works in the background and the footbridge give any link to the past. From the signal box at Hall Dean, the sidings that once led to Vane Tempest also lie overgrown. A pacer unit passes on one of the local trains on this coastal route. The signal box is virtually unchanged, and the signalling diagram inside it shows us how the track layout here has changed through the years. The gradient diagram also shows how this box is sighted near to the top of the climb in either direction. Vane Tempest is now, like most collieries, closed. A sprinter comes past the box in the other direction. This is one of the few locations still controlled by conventional signalling. There is still freight traffic on the route, but no coal from Vane Tempest. This 60 is heading south with oil tanks. The steep bank to Seton is devoid of rails. The collieries closed and, devoid of traffic, the line became redundant. A few rails remain, embedded in the road. Ryhope Grange still exists and still boasts a double junction. However, the lines to the right behind the speed limit signs are no longer in use. They led to Seaton. The other junction serves Sunderland South Dock. From the redundant sidings, we see a southbound pacer. Through the weeds, a Class 156 Sprinter is nearly ghostly as we bid farewell to the northeast coast.
one part of the East Coast mainline story remains to be told, the Deltic era. These diesel locomotives built up nearly as great a reputation as their illustrious forebears, or in some eyes, an even greater one. They represent the first diesel era on the ECML. The HSTs were the second. Another of the Deltics emerges from Stoke Tunnel with a northbound express and passes a class 47, which covered secondary duties during the late 1960s and through the 70s. 55008 races up to the tunnel with a northbound express. At Doncaster, a diesel multiple unit was on local duties whilst another member of the magnificent Deltic class departs northwards with a train for York. The Deltics based at English Sheds were named, in true East Coast tradition, after classic racehorses, whilst the Scottish ones bore the names of military regiments. All were maintained at Doncaster, and all, except for those which escaped the cutter's torch, were dismantled here after their final withdrawal from service in January 1982. The demise of the Deltics came shortly before the demise of part of the East Coast Main Line itself. In the early 1980s, just before the Thatcher government and the miners had a few disagreements, British Coal won approval to develop a massive new coal field in the Selby area. This would seriously undermine the East Coast Main Line between Selby and York, so, somewhat against the grain of its policies towards both rail and coal, the government agreed to the building of a brand new main line from just north of Doncaster, skirting the western side of the coalfield, to York. Shortly afterwards, full electrification was authorised and wires were strung over the East Coast main line during the latter part of the decade. This is the present day approach to Stoke Tunnel, where classes 47 and, as here, 56 diesels can be seen on freight work. The 47s have continued in frontline work for over 30 years, having first appeared in 1962. They were adopted by British Railways as its standard heavy mixed traffic locomotives. Sprinter units also run under the wires, en route to and from destinations off the electrified network. Of course, as we've seen previously, Class 91s with Mark IV coaches are responsible for express passenger traffic. The Class 91s and their stock were designed with a sharply sloping profile. They were intended to be convertible to tilting trains if the technology, in view of the disastrous APT project, could be perfected. At the time this program was made, it seemed unlikely that money would be found for this conversion, although a number of continental railways have introduced them with complete success. Yet another example of Britain paving the way for overseas manufacturers to develop and reap the benefits. Now, if we want tilting trains, it seems we'll have to buy them from our EEC partners. Another 91 leaves Doncaster for Leeds. The electric wiring of the East Coast Main Line included the line from Doncaster to Leeds, as well as the East Coast Main Line itself to Edinburgh, later extended to Glasgow.
Also leaving Doncaster is a Class 58 on a coal train. The electrification was purely for passenger trains, although some post office traffic uses electric multiple units. The 58s were built specifically for coal traffic and were originally allocated to the Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire coalfield lines, but were dispersed around the system when the coalfields were decimated. The line, which was the product of the last big coalfield expansion, is seen here. As the only new stretch of main line built in the British Railways era, it never saw steam locomotives in service, although when it opened, HST diesels were its first trains. Selby itself has seen the greatest changes. When we saw the Deltic here as the 1980s opened, it was a main line station. Now it is merely a local station on the line from Doncaster to Hull. The through roads have disappeared. Only local trains use it. Some, such as this West Yorkshire PTE-sponsored Class 158 Sprinter, starting their journeys here. This one is heading for Manchester via Leeds. If King's Cross is at the head of the East Coast Main Line, York is its heart. We return to the days of steam as Peppercorn A1 Pacific 60157 Great Eastern runs by light engine. This class of 49 engines was the last type of purebred East Coast Pacific. As the Pacific is manoeuvred, a Robinson 04280 runs by with a well-filled tender of coal. 130 of these engines were built for the Great Central Railway from 1911 to 1920 and the design was chosen as a standard for the Railway Operating Division in the First World War. The London and North Eastern Railway bought 273 from the War Department. A War Department locomotive built for the Second World War is seen on a turntable. This is one of the 280 versions of Riddle's austerity goods engines. 733 of these were bought from the Ministry of Supply by the LNER and British Railways. 04280s, numbers 63671 and 63701, are seen in the shed yard. 63701, in filthy condition, ambles up to replenish her tender. Engines run by the busy shed, coded 50A. The shed was on the west side of the main line, north of the station. The National Railway Museum now occupies the site and the original shed buildings, somewhat modified with a modern and controversial roof. WD 90405 clanks by. It was to be withdrawn from Normanton Shed and sold for scrap to Arnott Young of Parkgate and Rawmarsh in December 1967. A Thompson B1460 running through the beautiful cathedral-like York station brings our sojourn at York in steam days to an end. We move along, not yet to now, but to York in the days of diesels. 
In 1981, a Class 45 peak enters the station from the south during British Railway's corporate blue era. The peak is followed by another one of the 22 legendary Deltics, number 55 or 10, the King's own Scottish borderer. This was near the end of the Deltics' reign, and they had attracted quite a considerable following. They were unique amongst the mainline diesel classes in being fitted with two-stroke engines, which gave them a very high power-to-weight ratio and a distinctive sound. move on again to the modern York, where the track layout has been substantially changed with the advent of the wires, but whose famous train shed remains undisturbed. Class 91s on East Coast mainline trains are of course the principal trains here. Soon after these scenes were taken, the franchise was let to the Great Northeastern Railway, who would repaint these thoroughbreds in a distinctive royal blue livery. Class 47s appear here on cross-country trains as well as freight. Even into the second half of the 1990s, some passenger trains remained in their hands, this one having travelled from Birmingham to York via Sheffield. The smaller Class 37s were adopted as BR standard mid-powered diesels and may be seen at York on freight such as this engineer's train. York remains a junction. The Scarborough Line joins the East Coast Main Line at the northern end of the station. Here we see a Class 158 Sprinter coming off the Scarborough Line. West Yorkshire PTE trains are also seen here. This is another 158 in their colours. A bus like Pacer boasts the same red and cream West Yorkshire PTE colours seen on the 158. Our last shot at York is a double then shot, as the LNER's second most famous and the world's fastest steam locomotive leaves York Station. This is Mallard in 1988, celebrating the 50th anniversary of its 126 mile an hour run down Stoke Bank. It can now be seen at the National Railway Museum, which is seen just behind the engine as it leaves. In 
If this program has left you wanting to see more, do ask for the other four programs in this Then and Now series. Ian Allen's SBS have a number of other railway series for your entertainment, including the Railway Roundabout series of 1950s and 60s action, which is based on the BBC programmes of that time. You can also learn about the history of Britain's railways in a series of four programmes, and enjoy five decades of steam from the 1920s to the 1960s.